You've been dreaming of this since the day your father died. It doesn't matter if you kill me. In fact, I'm content. You are clearly a better choice to lead Rome. It seems the park I intended my role to be in molding the first emperor of Rome. When I am dead, your reign will begin. Salway Rebius. I don't have much to say. Let me repay you for manipulating me and exploiting me your whole life. Tiberius, you fool. You weakling. And now, you'll do the dirty Shut deeds of- up! It's finally over. It almost seems unreal. The beginning of what? You have violated every single rule we set out to protect in the first place. You have killed Romans. Senators, even. There's one thing you get to decide for yourself now. We must submit ourselves to the judgment of the Senate, as we discussed. Only then can we begin to undo some of the damage we have caused. Are you stupid? Did you hit your head in battle? We will all be killed! Not all of us. He will probably be condemned to death indeed, but we will not be punished as harshly. We should not get punished at all! We should take over Rome and live like kings! The Anira is right. Surrender will only lead to execution. But... Magister... Surely morals dictate that he should surrender. Doing anything else would be immoral, and thus make him a lesser man. He is like my own child. He would be a lesser man, but a man who is alive. They will not just let us go. We all attacked. Well, I certainly do not want to be executed. May I remind you what you have just said about the expected behavior of a moral individual? I don't consider myself a particularly moral man yet. I don't care about the philosophy of it. If you stay here, more people will die and the chaos will never end. We don't have to turn ourselves in if you're afraid of the consequences. We can simply leave. Please don't do this. I love you, but surely we did not stop a would-be king only to replace him with another. My debt to you is repaid. I certainly don't owe you any support if you try to overthrow the Republic. It's clear there is no changing your mind. Perhaps this was your goal all along. Well then, this is goodbye. I love you. If you truly believe this is the right thing to do, then I stand by you. Good. Your love is stronger than all this. So it was that the Republic of Rome, which had long rested on an unsteady foundation, was finally torn to the ground. From the rubble rose a new, strong empire. Though the institution of the Senate was maintained for centuries to come, all power was stripped from it and granted almost in full to the new ruler of Rome. From Lost Sion to Legionarius to Legatus and finally to Emperor, the first citizen of Rome had broken with all traditions and betrayed the faith of many during his meteoric rise to power. But as much as those who once held power now loathed their new ruler, he was greatly beloved by the people of Rome, for whom life universally improved under his rule. As he built Rome up from a regional power to an empire spanning the continent, he came to be revered almost like a god. Old Cineros, the emperor's most beloved Servus. Though he was free, he would not leave the side of his Dominus until the day he died. He lived many more years in luxury and leisure, with access to the finest works of philosophy, visited by great scholars from near and far. Freed of his domestic duties, he even found the time to author a great work of his own, 
a treatise on the topic of regret and forgiveness. Though its contents are lost to time, we must imagine that its completion brought him great satisfaction. Caeso left Rome with Lucia and their daughter. They traveled to Africa as Caeso remembered the warm nights and the lush Nile Delta fondly. Here they found a place to settle and made a peaceful home for their family. Though their relationship was distant at first, their devotion to their child drew them together, and their affection for each other grew stronger through the years. To his surprise, Caeso took well to fatherhood, and soon he and Lucia had many more children. Calida's second marriage turned out considerably better than her first. With her beloved husband committed to letting her live her best life, she was happy to settle down by his side, supporting him in his endeavors as he supported her. Calida was happy to find that it was possible to be a wife and a mother without giving up the things she loved. She taught their children archery and horseback riding, and nobody ever again looked down on her for her unwomanly pursuits. Bestia stayed by the side of the Emperor of Rome, becoming the leader of a new Imperial Guard. Uncompromisingly loyal, he was an enforcer as much as he was a protector, and eventually he became one of the most feared men in the Empire. As soon as things had quieted down, Bestia traveled to Africa once more to look for his sister. He did find her and bring her home, and she lived happily there for the rest of her life. Once everything had settled down, Deianeira returned to her homelands in Shervia, where she reconnected with her family. She brought some of them with her back to Rome, where they settled into a life of luxury. Though they would never feel quite at home in the city, they found that it was much easier to be outsiders together than alone. Deianeira always remained loyal to her friends. Rutelius Skyawala left Roman politics and moved to Upper Latium with his wife Liviana where they raised their children together in peace. Cato withdrew from the Senate sometime during Rome's transition from Republic to Empire. The shift in the power balance that he had helped facilitate never sat well with him, and his disappointment in himself haunted him for the rest of his life. He never again entered politics, but nor did he ever join any of the early attempts to overthrow the new dictator. It seemed Cato's convictions had been taken from him. Cicero remained in the Senate, even after the institution had become a mere shell of what it once was. He saw his purpose as the voice of dissent, the most prominent leader of the opposition to Rome's new ruler. Though it could be argued that he was unsuccessful in saving or restoring the Republic, there is little doubt that his work brought about a more just empire. Pompeius left Rome and returned to Hispania. There he became the focal point of an effort to wrest Rome once more away from its new ruler, with an eye to restoring the lost republic. The great general and his supporters raised ten legions and marched upon Rome, where they were destroyed in a humiliating defeat. Pompeius then fled to Egypt, where he was murdered by an unknown party upon his arrival. With Mithridates dead and his sons lacking his ability to rule, Pontus was soon annexed by Rome. The region never again rose to prominence. With Zenobia in charge of Musia, it became once more a peaceful part of the Roman province of Asia Minor, with her focus on trade and strong ties to the neighboring regions her people enjoyed a period of great prosperity. Without the leadership of Damianos, the rebellion of his gladiators soon spiraled out of control, beginning what became known as the Servile War. Escaped slaves terrorized the Roman citizens throughout Thracia until the wealthy senator Crassus brutally defeated them and crucified thousands along the road towards Rome. With the death of the Pharaoh Ptolemy and Queen Cleopatra, the Ptolemaic dynasty had fallen. With Rome finally at peace and under strong leadership, Egypt simply became another province ruled by a succession of proconsuls who cared more about lining their own pockets 
and improving the lives of Egyptians. Over the years, several attempts were made to claw back self-governance for Egypt, but time and again, Rome struck down all dissent. With the death of Cleopatra and under the steady guidance of Lunya, the Zarmanes once more became a peaceful and prosperous part of Africa Proconsularis, firmly aligned with Rome. As the eldest and most respected elder of the Berber tribes, Lunya became a singular figure of leadership and respect in the region. She was said to be more than a hundred years old when she died. After traveling all across Africa for many years, going wherever her instincts took her, Raya eventually returned to Memphis and to the service of Tenea at the Temple of Ubasti. When her mentor passed away, Raya naturally assumed the mantle as High Priestess of the Cat Goddess. Though the old faith was dwindling, she was greatly beloved by many, and her temple prospered, always home to many, many, many cats. With Diwitiacus once more assuming rulership of the Idwi, the tribe maintained a strong alliance with Rome, and through it, they greatly prospered. With the aid of the Idwi, Gallia slowly unified under Roman rule, and civilization soon began to creep into those lands in the form of paved roads, aqueducts, and fortified Roman towns. In his old age, did the Druid ever regret hastening the absorption and suppression of his own faith and culture? We will never know. The defeat and death of Wakingatorix had reduced the once mighty Awerni tribe to a myriad bickering chieftains. Without his vision, his charisma, and his resolve, there was no unifying figure to rally around, and no way for Gallia to resist their slow but inevitable assimilation into Rome. Perhaps if Wakingatorix had lived, some of their culture or religion might have survived in some form. But surely they must be grateful that civilization at last was brought to their lands. In this work, I have done my best to recount the history of this fascinating period, truthfully and accurately. As I have scoured the sources and spoken to many who claimed to have heard the story from someone who was there at the time, one thing that has stood out to me is the pivotal moments along the way where our story could have turned out very differently. Could the Republic have continued without an emperor? I believe so, if the Legatus had been willing to make the necessary sacrifices. But it is clear that the personal cost would have been great, as would the risk to the highly troubled Republic in the absence of leadership. In many ways, Rome was already an empire in want of an emperor. One should always take care when second-guessing historical figures with the benefit of hindsight. Here in the present, there will never truly be a way for you to know how you might have acted if you had lived in the past. Nor can you ever be certain how history will remember you. <laughs>